<clears throat> Morning. Okay, random thought for you this morning. I can't remember the last time I had a bath. Now, don't worry, I've had plenty of showers. <laughs> Hands up if you're a bath person. Okay, okay. I'm not a bath person um, at all. I can't imagine any worse than all the hassle of lighting the candles, running a bath, pouring in the bubble bath, uh, and just lying in your own filth for an hour. I just, I just don't get it. Who's got time for that? Um, I'm a shower person, okay? So I just find it refreshing and quick. It wakes me up in the morning and I'm ready to go. But unfortunately, our shower hasn't been working properly for years. You know the bit that holds the shower head? If you put the pressure on too high, it ends up moving and splashing you in the face full force. So it's not a very pleasurable experience. And it's been like this for years. Until I said to Alan, Alan, can you have a look at this shower now? It's getting ridiculous. And he noticed, actually, there's a little screw there. All it needs is a little tighten, and it'll hold the shower, <laughs> shower head in place. And um, because of the problem we had, what we were doing to compensate for the moving shower head was that we would turn the pressure down a little bit, okay, so that it wouldn't move, and then you could just stand there not fearing a full blast in your face. So every shower I've had for the last two or three years, or maybe more even, um, it's been with the pressure turned down. So I've been suffering with this dribbly weak shower for no reason at all. That was sorted in two seconds once we found out about the screw. So this week, because Alan fixed it this week, and since I've been standing there enjoying the full pressure, it made me think all along it was as simple as turning a screw and turning the pressure right up. Now, I tell you this story not to make my husband feel bad, but <laughs> although that's a, a nice little bonus. Um, but I tell you this story because I think our Christian lives can be a little bit similar sometimes, you know. And we're told in Ephesians that there is immeasurably more to be experienced. There's immeasurably more power. There's immeasurably more power that we are to enjoy. And yet, even though that power is ours, it's sitting there waiting for us to tap into it. But so often, we neglect it. And we go through our everyday lives going through the motions. Maybe we come on a Sunday morning and we connect with God that way. Maybe we read our Bible during the week. And maybe we attend a house group, which is great. But there is immeasurably more power to be experiencing God, I think, than we sometimes realized. So for years, the water pressure in my shower was turned down when I could have easily solved the problem and I could have enjoyed the powerful flow that I'm enjoying now every single time. And I think as we turn back to the book of Ephesians this morning, um, this is a bit of what Paul is going to pray for. Um, Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, and that's what we've got this morning. My passage that was given to me is a, a prayer by Paul for the Ephesian church that he knew very well. He helped to plant it. He had visited it, and he loved the people there. And Paul's prayer for them and for us <coughs> this morning is that we would just turn up the flow of what is already available to us. <coughs> so let's read Ephesians 1. 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, I know most of us, if we're completely honest, maybe we don't feel this immeasurable power all the time in our day-to-day lives. Maybe it's not something that we can fully relate to. I mean, if I'm honest, I've got to say, I can't say that I feel this power at work in my life every single day. And to be fair, I don't think I'd be alone in that. And I think that's exactly why Paul knew that while the church in Ephesus was doing really well and he loved them dearly, he knew that they, like us, need to be reminded of the immeasurable power of God. And, you know, I I started to pray and I I thought long and hard, why? Why don't I feel this experience of God's immeasurable power from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through the week? Why aren't I feeling that? And I think think that this is what may be the issue for me anyway. Paul mentions um, that the eyes of the heart... um, need to be opened. Our eyes need to be enlightened, if you like, the eyes of our heart. And, you know, as Christians, we always sing, I was blind, but now I see. But I think still a lot of us, me included, although we're Christians, are still quite blind sometimes. And if our eyes need to be enlightened, as Paul says, it makes sense to think that our eyes now must be dull. And it was certainly the case for the Ephesians. Paul felt that they didn't have a real enough sense of God's divine power working in them. And I think there may be two reasons why that may be. It's skipping. Is there two more, Cain? One, there should be one. Is there? It's not coming up. Okay, never mind. The first reason I think that we struggle with seeing God's power is I don't think we fully realize the huge power of sin in our lives. Now, as we go about our day-to-day business, we're just not aware of the deadly grip that sin has on us. And do you know why that is? It's because you've been saved and every day of your life, your sin is being conquered by the power of God. And think of it like this, you know, you only appreciate how well your painkillers are working for you if you've experienced the pain. If you've experienced the pain you're being saved from, you begin to really appreciate your painkillers. So if you're not in pain, I'm fine this morning, no huge pain, no headache, no pain in my joints, nothing. But if you're in pain and you're suffering you are going to appreciate that medication more than ever when that kicks in, okay? Now, as some of you know, my mother had um, a replacement knee operation not long ago, and a night or two after she came out of hospital, in her wisdom, she thought, oh, my pain isn't so bad tonight. I won't take my painkiller tonight. And of course, she paid the price. That was a bad mistake. She had a terrible night. She learned her lesson very quickly to take the painkillers. And she didn't realize how hard those painkillers were working for her until she stopped taking them. And I think that's part of our problem. We're not aware thankfully, you could say, or we don't feel the deadly power that sin has on our lives. And if we're sitting here this morning experiencing any kind of victory at all over sin, any measure of victory at all in our lives, we should be standing in awe at the mighty power of God. If we only knew the depths of our sin, you know, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Yet God's immeasurable power is holding us and enabling us to gain victory over our sin again and again, day in and day out. 
The second thing I think is one of the reasons we don't feel the power in the same way I don't think we realize or we don't feel the power of Satan working against us every day in our lives. You know, I think if only we realize what was coming against us from Satan every minute of every day, we'd be quaking in our boots. Later on from this passage in Ephesians, Paul reminds us, in chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, that's scary, isn't it? And let's not kid ourselves, Satan hates us more than anyone, because we are followers of Christ. He can't think of anything better than to trip us up and stop us on our journey. I don't know if any of you have ever read um, Frank Peretti's books. Have you ever heard of um, This Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness? Um, they're fictional novels about the spiritual battle over the souls of people in a small town in America. And, you know, when I read them when I was in university, I, my eyes were just open to this spiritual battle like never before. And I know these are fictional novels, but they are talking about the reality of the power of darkness working against us as Christians. So I'll say this again. If we're feeling any measure of safety today... If you're sitting here feeling relatively safe, then we should be amazed by God's protection. But, you know, we'd only appreciate that protection if we fully realize the strength of the enemy that God is working so hard to keep at bay. You know, our eyes are dull to it and we don't see it. For the last few weeks, I haven't been able to stop listening to a song. I think I've driven the boys bananas. Um... The song we sang last week, The Goodness of God. And I think the line that sums all of this up for me, there's a couple, but in particular, I have lived in the goodness of God. And you know, we are living in the goodness of God day by day. And we appreciate that to some degree, but we have no idea, no real realization of the power of God and all that it's, he's doing around us and for us and through us. He is constantly engaged in a battle with the enemy to ensure our protection, our safety, our physical and spiritual well-being. Jesus is intercessing on our behalf every minute of every day. Do you feel safe this morning? If you do, we should be in awe and wonder of the power of God at work in our lives that allows that to happen. So let's look more closely at, at the passage. Um, Paul is concerned about the church in Ephesus. He's praying for them. And what struck me straight away about this prayer is that Paul isn't asking God for things that they don't already have. He's asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to them what they already have. The same as my shower, that pressure was always there. But I had it turned down. As I even said last week, he's praying that they'd have a bigger view of God. And sometimes, you know, I'm exactly the same. We're just so happy to settle for a dribble of God's power when actually he wants us to experience his full flow, his immeasurable power in our lives. If we depended less maybe on how we feel, we are very human, human beings, and we depend a lot on how we feel, our emotions, but if we just realize who we are in Christ, the power that we have, I think our lives would look quite different. So Paul is praying for three things uh, that, that he wants us and he wants the Ephesian church to know, okay? The greatness of the hope we have as Christians, the magnitude of our inheritance, and the power that God is working towards us. And as I was studying this passage, there were so many roads I could have gone down, and I, was, I got quite, you know, in a muddle thinking, what am I going to concentrate on? And I didn't even realize it was Pentecost until I even said, but I just felt I wanted to concentrate on the power that God is working towards us in our day-to-day -day lives. So Paul is praying that the Holy Spirit would give them illumination and as a result, a real knowing. 
So what does he mean by that? So Paul is praying that they and us would have an experience of these things. The heart is known, you know, as the seat of emotion, isn't it? It's where our um, where we feel our hurt, our love, grief, hope, joy. And so he's praying that the eyes of our hearts will be open, that we'll be able to experience and feel these things as we do our own emotions. So, I mean, you could just read the passage as we've done this morning and you find out that these are the three things. But I'm not talking about a kind of knowing of facts here. Even the enemy knows these things about us as Christians. And it's, it's like holding up a tin of baked beans, okay, and saying, I know these are baked beans because it says so on the label. But if you dip your spoon in and you taste them, then you really know they're baked beans. By tasting them, you're experiencing the flavor, you're feeling the texture, and this way, you really experience what they are. So it's more than just knowing your Bible. And as important as that is, I think that we shouldn't be reading our Bibles to know the Bible better. We should be reading the Bible to know the author better. So it's about relationship, not rules. In Welsh, as it's a far superior language to English, as you all know, we actually have two different words for no in Welsh. We have gwybod, to know a fact, to know something, and we have a nabod, which is to know a person. So two different words. And the word gwybod, it would be incorrect grammatically to use that for a person. You have to use a nabod for a person because that's the only way to know a person. It suggests a relationship, an intimacy, a kind of personal experience. And this is what Paul wants us to know, not to know them with our mind, but to know them, to feel them and experience them in our hearts so that they affect the way that we live day to day. And when we get to verse 19, Paul compares the power of God towards us to the power that God has used in the past, okay? He explains five things that the power of God has already accomplished so that we can realize, and hopefully the penny will drop, how mighty the power of God is that he extends to us on a day-to-day basis. So I'm just going to quickly go over each one of these five. I'm not going to be long. So, the power that God is working in us is the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. So, let's be clear here. Death has been defeated. Death has died for all that are in Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. When we accepted Christ as our saviour, we died to ourselves. The old man has gone, and now we live in the power of Christ. My death has already been died. I am dead to my old self. We are alive in Christ. Yes, one day our bodies will die, But the Bible tells us that death is swallowed up in victory and asks, death, where's your sting? The law, and this is what I was so, I don't know, excited by, the law, which was impossible for us to keep before, right? That law has been satisfied. There is no legal case against us anymore. We are free to live. And, you know, when our time's up, we won't really die John 11, 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So it's over for death. And I want to encourage you this morning. We have nothing to fear in death. If you are a Christian, one thing I've come to realize fairly recently is that there there won't be a single second in that moment we call death. When we are out of relationship with Jesus, not a millisecond, it's done. Death has no power over you. And if you're a Christian here today, now is time to feel that power. Experience it, own it, live it, and enjoy it. This is the mighty power that God is working in your life. Secondly... That power is the same power that seated him 
at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Later on in Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he conquered our death. And when God exalted him to the highest place, he exalted you to his right hand. You know, we've already been raised up. We're already at his right hand. It's only a matter of time until we inherit everything that Jesus has won for us on the cross. And what a glorious hope that is. That very power that accomplished all this is at work right this minute towards you. And we just need to be woken up to that and to live in it, to walk in it, to experience it and to know it like never before because our eyes have been dull. We've been asleep to it. We're not owning it. We're not tasting it, even though it's true for us. The third thing, the power that God works towards us is the same power that placed him far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, in the Ephesian church would have been quite used to this feeling of power because, of course, they would have been under Roman rule, and they would have seen Roman soldiers exerting their power left, right, and center. And also, not only that kind of uh, power that humankind can exert, there was also uh, quite a famous temple in Ephesus at the time to the goddess Diana. And, you know, there were lots of gods, idols, lots of, of, of power in Ephesus. So this is really important to the Ephesians. They needed to be reminded that Jesus' power is far supreme to any power that they've ever experienced or seen or heard of. Whoever is worshipping in those temples, Jesus' power is far above all. And the power that is at work towards you this morning is the power that puts Satan himself under Jesus' feet. Look at those words, rulers and authorities. What does Paul mean by that? I'll just tell you again what I read earlier. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is Satan and his demons working against Christians every day. And if you're not acutely aware of these forces working against you, and thank God I'm not most of the time, and if you're not, then we should be amazed at the power of God at work in our life. His incredible power. You know, being a Christian immediately puts a target on your back. Satan isn't too concerned with people who aren't following him. They're already off course and doing what he wants them to do. But you, you're a real threat to him. And we need to be clear, we wouldn't stand the tiniest chance against Satan if God's power was not working in our lives. Satan hates Christians. Remember, he's supernatural. We are natural. So how are we surviving? Well, I'll tell you how. It's the power of God that's sustaining us. God is working his immeasurable power towards us. He is fighting our battles for us while we sleep, while we argue among ourselves, and while we complain, and while we continue to sin. Colossians 2 verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it's no accident that in that prayer, there are those words, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Because I'll tell you what, we wouldn't stand a chance if God didn't answer that prayer for us every single day. One of the speakers in, um, oh, it's not coming up for some reason. One of the speakers in Cherish was Priscilla Shira and I, I loved her, I've got to say. She was fantastic, and I had heard of her before. And one of her quotes was, what a shame it would be if the enemy believed more about our potential than we do. 
What a shame it would be if the enemy believed more about our potential than we do. We need to realize it this morning. Fourthly, it's the same power that placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head of everything. So the question that immediately came to my mind when I read that was, well, what is all things? Are our bad habits all things? Yes. Are our addictions all things? Yes. Are our mistakes all things? Yes. Is our indifference all things? Yes. Is our pride, stubbornness, inconsistency, laziness all things? Yes. Whatever is wrong in your life, he's placed them under Jesus' feet. He's placed all humans, all diseases, all of nature, weather, lightning, winds, rain, floods, global warming, all inventions, the media, the internet, governments, kings, religions, solar systems, stars, galaxies, yes, even Brexit under Jesus' feet. And on top of that, he's placed 10,000 other things that we're not even aware of. They're all under the feet of Jesus, which means that these things are all under our feet and they have no business hampering our Christian lives anymore. We don't have to battle these things in our own strength. And that is the classic mistake that we fall into day to day, isn't it? We're battling these things in our own strength. All we need to do is remember that they're under his feet. And as we are children of God, they are under our feet. All we need to do is ask him to give us his power to overcome them. And then the battle is won and the victory is ours. And the fifth thing, it's the same power that makes the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And I've got to be honest here. I'm not even sure I understand this next bit. But I am going to attempt an explanation. (laughs) We as Christians... As the church are his body, I got that. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So I read this in the message just to get a bit of clarity and to dumb it down for me maybe. (laughs) Um, And it said, the church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. So wow, that is what I take this to mean, that God wants to use us, the church, his body, to take his presence into the world. That he is wanting us to carry his presence and with that his immeasurable power and his love to a lost and dying world. And guess what? He fully trusts us to do the job. So this is our task as the church, not just to meet, to have nice services, but to carry this power into the world and fill it with his presence. This is our commission, and God entrusts us with this responsibility. We are his hands and his feet. Now, I know that we know that, but do we really know that? And quite often, we don't feel like we are carrying the presence of God with us. Another quote from Priscilla Shira from Cherish. Don't act like how you feel. Act like the truth of who God declares you to be. Remember, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. So I'm closing with this. You know, let's just pray for our eyes to see. These things are too big. They're too spectacular for us as humans to grasp. Our minds are too small And we can only grasp them if God answers our prayer. And we can only grasp them if God reveals them to us by his Holy Spirit. Which is why Paul was praying this prayer in the first place. And he prayed it for the Ephesians and I'm praying it for us this morning. So why should we live under a dribble of water from a broken shower when we can live under the full flow, the full pressure of the immeasurable greatness of God's power towards us. Let's wake up. Let's pray that God will open the eyes of our hearts so that we can realize who we are and what we have in him. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.